Environment Secretary Hilary Benn spoke about the importance of resource efficiency at the launch of the Aldersgate Group's Beyond Carbon report. It seems to me that this is one of the fundamental uh, questions that we have to uh, confront, namely, what is this thing, a resource efficient economy, and what will it look like? And I think in order to get there, we've got to take one word in the English language that we're rather familiar with, uh, a word we use a lot at the moment, uh, which is a word which represents an expensive headache uh, for some societies, uh, which represents an environmental catastrophe for other societies, and put it where it should be, which is uh, in the history books, and that is the word waste, a word that we have uh, all uh, grown up with. And I say that uh, for the very simple reason that we've reached a point in human development where the thing that we call waste needs to be seen for what it really is. It is a resource. It's not something that we can do this to and that to and hope that we can forget about it. We ought to describe it as such. Uh, and when we have done that and use it in that way, with that way of thinking, then we will, it seems to me, have achieved uh, an economy and a society that uses the resources that we've got on this planet wisely and well. That's what we're trying to achieve. Now, when you put it like that, I suppose in one sense it sounds pretty darn obvious, not least because we know the Earth's resources are finite, some like metals and minerals uh, we extract from the Earth, others like sunlight and crops are part of the renewable cycle. And it seems to me we've got to start treating the first group like we currently treat uh, the second group. As human beings, we're a species. Uh, we live on carbon. Uh, we grow it, we consume it, uh, and one way or another, it's broken down, returned to the earth, and the cycle uh, starts again. And it seems to me we need to apply the same principles to metals and minerals that we extract from the earth. Uh, it is, frankly, economically, as we've just heard, and certainly environmentally, a bit bizarre that we don't do more of that already. Take a very practical example. We were discussing in the office uh, which one I might pick uh, to talk about today and I and I said well why don't we take aluminium now uh, as you all know you need to use a hell of a lot of bauxite ore uh, to make aluminium so it's incredibly energy intensive uh, and resource intensive to produce uh, it's one of the reasons why if you happen to go around and collect up used aluminium someone will pay you currently about 700 pounds a ton to take it off your hands now that's the value which uh, is given by parts of society. We currently charge uh, you £40 a tonne for the privilege of sticking it in landfill, and it will rise to £72 a, a tonne by 2013. Even though we know that if you want to make a new aluminium can, because that's the form in which most people would recognise what you're talking about, it uses 19 times less energy to make a new aluminium can out of the old aluminium cans you've uh, collected than it does to produce a new tonne. So it ought to be pretty darn obvious to us as a society that chucking it away is not a sensible use of this very scarce resource, both in itself and because of the energy that is involved. And one of the things it seems to me that Beyond Carbon does really well is to make the obvious point that market economies don't always put the right price on what is really valuable. Um, and I think it's a very good point, and it was one that Paul was making when I came through the door at the back. And by the way, can I pay tribute to the work that NISP has done to bring those who've got stuff they no longer need, together with those who can make good use of it. Uh, the market hasn't done that in the past, and it doesn't fully do it today. An example from history, um, if you go back to 1636 and 1637, for those of you who are interested, um, Holland's financial markets caught tulip mania. I didn't know this until about a week ago, but historians among you will know this. Tulip bulbs in Holland suddenly acquired extraordinary value because everyone was after them. They exchanged hand for vast amounts of money. At one point, one person offered 12 acres of land, 12 acres of land, to buy one tulip bulb in the 17th century. Now, uh, tulip bulbs are not uh, in themselves intrinsically <coughs> valuable, beautiful though tulips are. Uh, you can't eat them, uh, I'm told, unless you boil them extensively. They certainly don't provide us with shelter, and they can't produce energy. Uh, surprise, surprise, the tulip bubble collapsed, and many people were ruined, holding a lot of bulbs that suddenly weren't worth anything at all. Now, it's a cautionary tale, 
Uh, but all of us in this room do know that natural resources have uh, real value. And frankly, we need to create a loop uh, in which things like timber and aluminium and iron and gypsum are treated as assets with life cycles as near as infinite and as technology and practicality can make them. It seems to me that's too what we should be aiming for. Uh, and it isn't just government's responsibility, although we have to play our part, uh, or yours, or even consumers, because this can't happen in isolation. If we're going to close the loop in our use of resources, then we all of us need to start making the right decisions and the right choices that will turn us into a, a greener society. So I think we've got to the point where we've stopped rushing headlong in the wrong direction uh, towards indiscriminate consumption of the Earth's resources, because we kind of understand at the rate of which we're using them, particularly in the rich world, what? At the rate of, of three times the Earth's capacity to sustain it. And as my predecessor, David Miliband, would you know, often say, it's not that we've got another two cupboards in the planet somewhere to call on when we've exhausted the one that we've got. We just have the one. Uh, and we're in the process of screeching to a halt and turning round and trying to move in the right direction. And we're making some progress. If you take household waste, for example, the proportion of that that is recycled has risen from, what, 8% to 37% in the space of about 12 years. And the landfill levy has played a really important part in making it happen. And when you made the point, Paul, about regulation being part of the answer, there's a, it seems to me there's a really smart bit of policy, because the alternative would have been for the government to say, right, every council, you'll all have a blue box, a green box, and a yellow box. You will collect this on a Monday, this on a Tuesday, this on a Wednesday. We could have done that. But instead, we provided a very clear incentive to local authorities to move from collecting very little in the way of recycled material to collecting quite a lot. And we've got more to do, and I shall come back to that uh, in a moment. Uh, last year, uh, last month, I launched our new f food strategy, which is the first of its kind for 60 years or so, and it calls on all parts of the supply chain, farmers, manufacturing, retailers, uh, caterers, consumers, to look at what they can do to grow more, because we need to feed a growing world population, but in the process to minimise the emission of carbon in growing that food, and to try and cut the, the waste, in particular things like food waste, we dump a lot of food waste in landfill, methane, bad for the planet, uh, you can turn it into renewable energy. It's obvious uh, we've got to get the incentives right to make that uh, change. We know that the majority of waste in this country comes from business, about 90% of it. In one sense that's, I wouldn't quite describe it as bad news, but the good news means that if uh, business gets to work on this, then we can see further progress. And business is already ahead of domestic households in the rate to which waste is recycled. We know that from the last survey we did in 2002. We're about to do another because we need uh, better information. And what encourages me in my job most is when uh, you hear about people who are getting on and making it happen. Um, take, I mean, one example, uh, Boots, they work with their suppliers and designers to deliver a new freestanding display unit. Boots has a lot of display units in their stores. The result was it saved them about £400,000 a year in transport costs in the first 18 months alone. They still display their goods, they saved themselves money and resources. Take uh, Lang O'Rourke, which as you know is one of Britain's largest construction companies. It joined forces with the National Community Wood Recycling Project. It's helped to recycle hundreds of plywood boards in the local community. In that particular example, it's modest, but it saved nine tonnes of reusable wood from landfill. Or take United Utilities, which is generating energy from methane from the sewage works to help run the sewage works, saving themselves about £7 million uh, in the process. Now, those are three small examples, and there are lots and lots of others, and I'm sure you in the room could stand up and tell your story, and we need to tell them more to each other, of technology and innovation and will coming together to find a way of dealing uh, with the problem and showing what can be done if you put your mind uh, to it. And that is why Beyond Carbon asks for the evidence which we need in order to better understand the value and the extent of the resources that we've got. And I think that's a very, very uh, fair point indeed. Because the truth is, if we don't know what natural assets we've got, then how are we going to help each other to make the most of them? So trying to answer that question is a central part of DEFRA's Sustainable Consumption and Production Programme. Paul, thanks for the kind words you said about it. 
Uh, one of the things we're doing currently, and we commissioned the research last uh, month, is to try and ask the question, what does the future hold for resources over the next uh, 20 years? What's likely to become more scarce? What's going to happen to price? Uh, what may become insecure in terms of its supply, if you're looking around the world? Uh, which sectors might be at most risk and why? Uh, we're doing that, but I'm sure all of you are businesses are doing that already because it's about the future of your businesses and where you get your raw materials from. And if it's not a question that you're asking yourselves, I'm sure your investors and potential investors will be asking you the question in exactly the same way as carbon reporting and reduction in carbon emissions by businesses has been pushed by investors saying, hey, tell me about your exposure to carbon in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. It's helped to push change in the business community itself. Second point is this is also an opportunity as well as a change that we have to make. Um, we're supporting the European Commission in their work to try and agree common standards to measure how we use a wide range of resources. Now what the, the aim of this work is to allow us for the very first time to measure the resources coming in and the resources going out of Europe and to see what effect uh, policies are having. Are having. And it was a point that you were making in your presentation because we need to learn to count in more effective ways. We understand counting money. We've been doing it for a very long time. We're learning to count carbon, which is why we're trying the carbon reporting arrangements we put in place to try and make sure that the guidelines work before we come to review uh, mandatory reporting as promised under the Act. We need to count resources as well, and that includes in passing the natural resources of the world, the biodiversity on which ultimately all human existence depends. Now there is an example of thing, something that we have taken for granted as humankind as if it had an infinite capacity to replenish itself. It doesn't uh, and we need to be able to count uh, what we are doing to it. And that's why Beyond Carbon is absolutely right to call for right policies to help what you describe as the deep transition to resource efficiency and transition is the right word because it's how we get from where we are to where we need to be with the right practice the right policy the right technology the right innovation and some oomph uh, to make it uh, happen now one of the things that ought to be pushing us to do this is the fantastic opportunities that are out, that are out there because believe you me and you know it those who get there first whether it's finding ways of uh, reducing uh, your use of uh, of energy, reducing carbon emissions, new materials, new processes, you're going to find a huge demand in the world out there for what you have led the way on. And we were saw on the slide, you know, the size of the market in the UK is about £110 billion a year already for low carbon and environmental goods. About 900,000 people earn their living by working in that sector. Globally, the market is worth about £3,000 billion. It's growing. We need to have a growing share of that market as the United Kingdom. Some examples where we are making uh, some progress. Uh, we're certainly, as you know, home to more offshore generation of electricity from wind power than any other nation in the world. We've got to get some uh, manufacturing capacity. We've certainly got huge experience in steel fabrication. Just look at the North Sea. Uh, we are increasingly exporting our expertise in waste and water management. And I think as we come out of the recession, People can see when they ask the question, well, where are the jobs of the future going to come from? Well, here's where some of them, a really important number of those jobs are going to come from, because it's a change we have to make, and it's a change that will bring us great benefit if we do make it. And that's why Beyond Carbon rightly asks government to prioritise sustainability <coughs> and a low carbon future. We're publishing today uh, Recovery, Growth and the Environment, which makes that case for all businesses uh, to think about how environmental responsibility can improve uh, your business. We've already heard uh, from Paul about the potential to save that £6.4 billion uh, pounds a year by taking really simple steps. Every year, that's about 2% of UK business annual profits. At, at a time when money is tight, sounds like a pretty good thing uh, to do. You're also right to say that this question has got to be prioritised in public policy decisions and the document we're publishing today on our website uh, shows that and I think in fairness we have come from the foundation particularly that was 
created with, by the Commission on Environmental Markets and Economic Performance, published in 2006, and I know a number of you here today were involved in producing that, to the new industry, new job strategy that we just heard about, the low carbon industrial strategy. This is a story of progress, but I agree we need to do uh, more of it and to seize the opportunities that are there. We too have a responsibility to make sure we're doing the right thing in our own backyard. So just a couple of uh, examples. Take something like palm oil, big debate. We use palm oil in a whole host of products. Question, how sustainable is its production if the consequence is deforestation in other parts of the world which adds to the problem of uh, dangerous uh, climate change? We're trying to find out now what is the palm oil that's used in the things that government buys? There is now sustainable palm oil for the first time as a result of the work of the round table. Uh, are we buying it in a way that encourages sustainable palm oil plantation in other parts of the world as opposed to unsustainable with the deforestation that comes with it? Take an associated problem, illegal logging. We're working in the UK really hard to persuade all the countries of Europe to adopt a pretty simple policy, which is to say, in future, it will not be legal to put illegal timber from the rest of the world on the market in Europe. We've done it with fish in Europe. Why can't we do it with timber? Because then we'll be doing our bit to help my opposite numbers in countries where illegal logging is a problem to get that sorted because they know that the market for illegal timber will be reduced as a result of us doing the right thing. Take landfill. Having thought long and hard about this, as you may have seen, my view is the next stage to, to ally with the landfill uh, levy is to say, well, we're getting to the point where we ought to say there are certain products we just won't stick in landfill. Why would you put aluminium in landfill? Why would you put wood in landfill? Plastic, tin, food waste, paper, glass. Um, and we'll be publishing a consultation document in the next month and a half or so to say, uh, what do you think about moving to a date where for these products, may not be the same date for every product, we just say we're not going to stick it in landfill anymore because it seems to me that is the logical next step. And I wager uh, when we've done this in 30 or 40 years' time, people will look back with utter incredulity that this is what we used to do. Uh, so we ought to get on with make the, the change. And one final example, very practical, today the 1st of Feb, if you now go into a shop that sells more than four uh, A4 batteries, um, a, uh, a week, they now have to provide a bin for you to put your used batteries in so they can be recycled. It's a result of the, the batteries directive. It's a very practical system because I'm sure I'm not the only one if you put a battery in a, in a rubbish bin and thought, you know, that's, we're throwing something away there that we should, surely somebody can make use of it. You can. We've now got a system in this country to make it easy for people. Stick the batteries in the bag when you go shopping, uh, put it in the bin, and someone will extract as much as they can uh, from it. And just finally, uh, to say this, that you know, for the past 150 years, with all of the benefit that economic development has brought us, we've been running what I would describe as an unwinnable race against the planet. And we've come to realise that that is the case. And we know that the time has come to stop treating the gifts that the Earth gives us as if they were infinite, as if we had multiple uh, planets, and start using them in a very different way. And that's true uh, uh, for the planet, it's true for its ecosystems, it's true for the raw materials, it's true for biodiversity. It is time, finally, to close that uh, loop. And if, as part of that, we can confine uh, the word waste to the bin of history where it belongs, then we will have made progress. And I <coughs> applaud the Aldersgate Group for the report that you published today, because you've led uh, throughout on this, and what you're telling us today will help us to move forward and make further progress. Thank you very much indeed.